Hello, Tar Heel Nation. We're back, finally back, again with another uh, UNC Hoops Talk podcast. It's, again, been a month off and, and not a lot to talk about, um, but we're hopefully starting to gear up for another season here. I got Blake back. If you have been watching the podcast for any considerable amount of time, you've seen Blake here on the podcast uh, from keepingitheel.com. Uh, it's at Blake KCMO on, on Twitter. Uh, Blake, how you doing? You ready to go? Yeah, I'm good. Um, I'm just glad to have uh, something at all to talk about. There hadn't been a whole lot lately. Um, the last dance was about the the most exciting thing that's happened. Uh, so after that ended, it's it's been pretty dry. <laughs> yeah, and and it, and it seems like time is just kind of drawing out there. So uh, hopefully, starting to look back uh, to this upcoming season, the 2021 season, uh, and I guess we'll start there. Uh, is there any chance this season doesn't happen or looks different what what are your kind of i don't know unpredicted predictions man you know right now i'm mostly i'm thinking about football um because that's next on the horizon um i think that even though they're totally different games totally different sports totally different venues and settings and, and the amount of people are obviously very different i think that um one could definitely impact the other um you know if if football somehow doesn't happen if student athletes aren't allowed to you know, partake in, in uh, you know, team activities and workouts and things like that in, in the normal type of structure. Um, I think that could trickle down to other sports, obviously. Now, as time goes on and, you know, basketball comes, you know, farther in the in the year than football, that, you know, it could be less impactful then. Um, but I'm still not convinced that football happens, certainly not in the same manner in which it normally does. Uh, but I'm certainly hoping it does. And the same thing with basketball. Um, I just don't know if we're going to have thousands and thousands of fans packed in stadiums or not, but um, fingers crossed, um, not just for sports, but just for life in general, um, that we can get things back to normal and, and kind of get functioning at a, you know, something other than a suboptimal level like we have been for several months. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's it football and basketball right now go hand in hand because, you know, if we can get it figured out with football, we give all the better chance of basketball happening. And it looked good for football here, you know, people coming back to campuses, starting workouts. And then, you know, the biggest thing I've seen since all that happened was, of course, the Clemson uh, ordeal where it was 15, 20 people, you know, come down with it. So maybe it's the same question, maybe the same answer. But, you know, does football happen without fans or, you know, in some capacity? Um, I certainly think it's possible now. I think the NFL and college will differ in that sense because of, of a you know, myriad of reasons. Um, I'm hoping for both to happen because right now I'm kind of going crazy. Uh, As we all but are. I, I, I do think that there could be um, stadiums that are half empty or, or maybe with not very many people at all. Um, now, obviously, that's going to take a huge hit on revenues and things like that. Uh, but in my mind, uh, you know, there's nothing you can do to change that, you know, in terms of if you're able to play the games, play the games, you know, from a healthy standpoint, if you're able to get these kids out here and have referees and coaches and, and, you know, medical staff out here in a, in a safe and healthy, um, you know, manner than, than play the games. Um, you know, the money's not going to be, you know, won back by not playing the games. So, um, you know, maybe TV ratings are up and that can help someone somehow with some kind of a profit share. I don't know how it all looks. I don't know how it plays out. Um, certainly, I think if we can play football, um, then I would think that basketball happens too. Uh, I just don't know what the stands are going to look like. I'm very interested to find out what that's going to be like. Yeah, and I we probably should preface all of this talk is we are not experts, we're not doctors, we don't, you know, we don't have. I mean, we we've heard from UNC even, you know, how they're doing it, but we don't know all the ins and outs of of all this. So, uh, yeah, we probably should preface with that. And and in that sense, basketball is a little bit different than than football because it is indoors. Um, and and as far as you said too, the the revenue and and that people say, well, you're not you know, you're not uh, losing money by, you know, playing is you still have to travel. You, there's still that, there are still expenses uh, within, you know, having a basketball season. So all that lost revenue, uh, I know you don't, you lose the same amount of money if you don't have it, but you're also not spending the same amount of money, if that makes sense. So, uh, sure. you know, it's, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. Uh, it'll be, I don't know, I, I guess nail biting because I think everybody is just, on edge and, and needs, you know, the relief. I know there's been a lot of talk with the NBA of players wanting to play. And then there's players that don't want to play 
you know, they don't want to distract, you know, we got other things besides the COVID-19 going on in our country now with all the uh, racism talks and, and movements and, you know, lots of people, lots of players saying it's going to take away from that movement. So there's a, there's a lot going into it, hopefully not as much into the college basketball. Um, hopefully, you know, coaches can get the teams together and, and yeah, hopefully we can keep those movements going along with adding sports back to those that those of us that are, are dying for some of that distraction uh, and maybe distraction is even the wrong word there. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that playing sports um, sort of takes away or, or detracts from those movements. I think it gives uh, a, a larger and more uh, front and center platform for, for a number of people. Um, I think that, uh, guys like LeBron James, guys like Kevin Durant, guys like Kyrie Irving, who's been very vocal. I, I think it obviously they already have a platform, but if you're playing four times a week, um, you're being interviewed twice a day. I, I think it actually magnifies that platform. And it um, certainly in a world right now without sports, the NBA would virtually be the only thing going um, sans a few things here and there. And I think it would re be really good for those guys to have uh, that ability to be vocal up front like that um, on a nightly basis. Um, but, you know, that's just one guy's opinion. Uh, I respect the fact that Kyrie feels differently, you know, about it. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, I, I obviously want what's best for, for the country. Um, I also want, um, you know, sports to come back um, at, at some point, um, you know, however that may look. Um, but I, I also know that there are more important things than entertainment value, um, going on right now in this country. Right. And, and ho I think hopefully that's a, as good a transition as we're going to get is we don't want to take away from the momentum that's being made, the movement that's going on. Um, but that being said, this is not a political podcast. It's not kind of why we're here. So, uh, hopefully recognizing that let's move into why, why we are here. The title of this podcast is the 2021 starting lineup for our Tar Heels. So um, again, it's been so long since we podcast. I, I believe we mentioned everybody that has signed. If not, the last signee was Kern Walton. We did get him. Uh, they've actually even released the numbers. Uh, so our roster is, is pretty much set. I don't, I don't see too much uh, being added to it, uh, even though we, we do have an available uh, scholarship left. Um, but so we're, where we are here, um, and you and you wrote an article on it. And we were talking before we went live here. There could be a little bit, you know, updates. Obviously, as we get closer to the season and, and things like that. Uh, where where do you want to start here? This whole starting lineup. You want to just throw yours out there. You want to go through it position by position. What should we do? We can go position by position. All right. So let's let's start. Probably. Well, let's start. This is this is kind of be a in the middle position. We're not starting point guard. We're not starting center. Let's go with probably the most stable. Um, and easiest to predict uh, starter, and that's the power forward. We, we pretty much know it's Garrison Brooks, and there's no other option, right? Garrison Brooks might be the best at his position in the country this year. Uh, yeah, it's un unquestionably going to be him in that position, um, both offensively and defensively. He's very, very good. Um, he's e even better of a defender than, than maybe I thought he would be. I knew he'd be very good, but he's also rounding into a terrific offensive player. Um, he's a good scorer. Uh, his jump shot's getting better. Um, he's he's able to shoot farther out on the court than he once was. Um, you know, he's he's a very good rebounder. Um, I do think that he'll probably be the team's second leading rebounder this year because I think Armando Baycott will will probably lead the team in rebounds. Um, but he's just very good at everything that he does, and he's a good leader too. So he will definitely be in that starting four spot. Yeah, and I think the leadership thing. I mean. Obviously, we've seen his his production, but I think the leadership thing is almost something that guarantees his starting point. And yeah, we, like you said, we saw his freshman and sophomore years. Uh, Roy just kind of rave about the defense he played. It maybe took a little bit hit last year because he was playing so many minutes and had to produce on the other end. But we saw that offensive jump in him, so we know it's there. The thing I kind of quit or uh, not question, but you kind of temper people's expectations on is his stats may not be as good this year which may be a good thing because he doesn't have to put up 35 and 15 or, you know, whatever he was doing last year, because we're going to be hopefully a lot more talented and, and balanced uh, as far as we go. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think anybody can really question um, him being the starter there. So let's jump up because the big guys are going to be 
a lot of the talk for this team is how deep we are, uh, and we've talked about it on this podcast already, but uh, does Baycott have that starting spot locked down at the center position, or what do you think? Absolutely. Um, barring an injury or something that's completely um, unforeseen or, in my mind, unreasonable to even uh, think could happen at this point. I, I, I've seen people talk about Dayron Sharp. I think he's a terrific young player. Um, I don't think there's any chance that he starts over Baycott this season. Baycott is too good of a rebounder. Um, I think at this point, if you move him down a rung, it also hurts his offensive production. Um, it hurts his consistency, which he struggled with last year anyway. I think that this year he's going to make a big leap. Um, the big guys in Roy Williams' coach teams typically tend to take a really big jump from freshman to sophomore year and sometimes even sophomore to, to junior, as we've seen with guys before, um, guys like Bryce Johnson. Um, but guys like Bryce Johnson, um, much like I'm saying with Big Hot, over those four years, their minutes increased each year. Um, and then you saw that production increase. You saw the efficiency and the consistency increase. Um, I think to take Armando Baycott out of the starting lineup at this point would be counterproductive and, and have a negative impact on, on him as a player and on the team. Um, like I said earlier, I think you'll see Baycott lead the team in rebounds. I think he'll flirt with a double-double this year. Um, very good area rebounder, gets his hand on a lot of balls um, and, and is able to pull those down with, with a great amount of efficiency. Now where I would like to see him get better and get stronger is in the low post, which I've talked about a lot. Um, he does commit a lot of errors, uh, you know, in the paint on the blocks. Uh, he oftentimes has the ball too low. Um, he needs to go straight back up with the ball. Many times where he brings the ball down and wants to dribble it once or wants to do some kind of a pump fake, he needs to go right back up. Um, and then hopefully at the same time increase his efficiency at the free throw line where he didn't shoot particularly well as a freshman. Um, but yeah, I 100% think that it's going to be um, Baycott and, and Brooks down low to start the season. And, and, you know, with Sharp and Kessler also, you know, in the fold, I think they're going to get, you know, plenty of minutes. And I think it's going to help them overall to come off the bench and work behind a couple of guys that I think will be very, very good together this year in Brooks and Baycott. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned those other two guys because I think we have to, you know, put them kind of in the mix, not even, you know, necessarily as starters, but playing some big minutes and important minutes. And, I, and I, like we said with Brooks, um, you know, his minutes may go down and Baycott, hopefully his minutes go down, but hopefully that helps, like you were saying, his consistency, that he can go all out for the minutes he's there and and grab just as many rebounds or even more than last year in less minutes played. And, you know, we saw him... Uh, deal with a couple of injuries last year. Hopefully those minutes, you know, take away for from possibilities of that. And, and just all the stuff that comes with playing a full season and ACC season for a get, big guy like that banging around and, and stepping on ankles or whatever it is. Um, those, those two guys behind him, Walker Kessler and, and Sharp, uh, just kind of what they add, you know, kind of um, by taking away from Baycott, hopefully adding to his game. Um, and then to go along with it, you know, kind of getting away from the starting lineup, but just the complexion of Kessler coming in and be able to spread out the floor, knocking down shots and just changing kind of the way we play. We could have almost two different teams here, but ten, you know, depending on who's in the game. Uh, so th there's our big guys. Uh, let's jump. Uh, maybe not the next closest to a lock. Maybe it is the next closest to a lock of a starter in the point guard position now. Uh, I, I mean, nobody's saying anybody but Caleb Love, right? Yeah, it's, it's Caleb Love 100%. Um, he's going to be the team's best uh, floor manager, uh, best ball handler. Uh, he's a terrific scorer. Um, he's a good facilitator. Um, he's going to be able to uh, get his own shots, and he's going to be able to help facilitate uh, uh, you know, other players um, in position to score too. Um, there's other guys that can play the point, and, and that's where this team's going to kind of differ a little bit and benefit this year, uh, where last year's team was kind of in trouble when Cole Anthony wasn't, wasn't out there. Um, was that, uh, you know, he didn't really have anybody to jump into that position, uh, did Roy Williams, uh, once Cole Anthony was out. Um, or, you know, if he was tired and needed to take a break. Um, you won't see that this year because you've got other guys that can step into that position. Um, R.J. Davis can certainly jump in there and play the point if he needs to. Um, I believe Anthony Harris could play the point uh, for short stints if he needed to. Um, you know, there's guys that you can plug in and, and play that point, if nothing else, just to give your starter a breather. And, and that's a valuable thing to have. And, you know, you, you don't want to have to play him 36 minutes a game and, and expect him to be as productive after, you know, a first half where he's played 18 minutes. 
you want to be able to give him a breather and, and have other guys in there that can can run that point position. But he is a a lock for that for that starting spot, and I think he'll be very very good too. So all that being said, this is something that I I don't know I haven't heard a lot talked about. Something I kind of worry about with with them not coming in for summer school and not getting those pickup games. How does that affect his you know early on development and getting you know getting down the system, getting know getting to know his teammates? You know, does that does that go away after December? You know, is that something we need? I should be worried about. I think it's similar to what you're going to see in Orlando when the NBA starts back up. I think guys are going to be rusty. Um, and I think, you know, guys like LeBron James are going to pick it back up fast, but you are going to see guys that don't look very good when they come back. Um, I think the same thing goes for, for college basketball, uh, particularly like you were mentioning for the freshmen, because the freshmen aren't getting valuable minutes out on that court right now. Um, you know, pickup games, practices, um, even just conditioning. You've got to hope that these guys are staying in really, really good shape on their own. Um, and, and the kind of shape that you get in on your own usually isn't, you know, athletics shape. Um, you know, there's, there's being in shape and then there's like football shape and there's basketball shape. And, and these guys probably aren't staying in Roy Williams condition type shape. Um, so I think it might be a bit concerning at the beginning of the season, but everybody's facing the same disadvantage right now. Um, so I think you may see some sloppy basketball. I think you may see some lackadaisical play. I think you may see some guys gassed after, you know, a couple of TV timeouts. Uh, but it just is what it is at this point. There's, there's nothing that you can do to change it. You've got to hope that, uh, you know, we can get these guys back. Uh, fully participating in, in, you know, practices and and conditioning and and drills and and the, you know you get them up to speed by the time the season rolls around or at least you know shortly after. Yeah, and it, we are pl- you know everybody's on the same playing field as far as conditioning, but not everybody plays as fast as UNC, so that may hurt us a little bit. And then you know all the talk about being the point guard in a Roy Williams system being the hardest position to to learn and to run and all that. Um, again, that's kind of what, what worries me here early. Again, does that affect us in February or March if we have a normal season? You know, hopefully not. Hopefully he gets there. And, and, and it kind of, uh, like you're saying, having other people to be able to come in and, and give him a breather or even Roy pull him out and say, hey, you know, look at what's going on here. And, you know, someone like a Leaky Black, you know, getting comfortable last year at point guard. Or uh, I know R.J. Davis is another freshman, but, you know, him being in there, um, you know, hopefully be able to give that breather, like you said, maybe a little bit of stability, uh, maybe slow it down to get it into, you know, Brooks and Baycott and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it is, it is that something that I definitely look at as, as maybe affecting North Carolina basketball more than the others, even though we're all in the same kind of conditions that we're playing in. Uh, so let's jump to kind of the last, probably sure starter we have here at the small forward uh, it's going to be Leaky Black, right? It's going to be, and a lot of people aren't happy about it, but but I would ask them, you know, who else do you want to put there, um, at least to start this season? I, You know, I, I've seen people talk about um, starting Puff Johnson. I've seen people, you know, talk about starting Kerwin Walton um, or any variety of people. Uh, it's almost as if they just want to start anybody but Leaky Black. Um, but I would, I would come back and say give him – Give him this year, and let's and let's see how he performs. And I think he will be good. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, we don't prefer to to see this. No one does to have sort of a non-scoring wing. You want to have a scoring wing. You want to have a wing that can can hit three pointers and that can slash and do all those things that you know we would have liked to have seen a Zaire Williams uh, that ended up choosing Stanford. Um, the type of things that he can do. Um, what Leakey can do that Zaire maybe can't is he has a versatility that many players don't possess. Um, he can score, he can drive, he can run the court very well. He can play point guard for a spell. Um, he can rebound well for his position. He's got great height. Um, so, uh, you know, he's got things, you know, that, that are very beneficial to that position that Roy Williams has utilized in the past guys like Jackie Manuel. Um, and granted, we are talking about two different teams. Jackie Manuel was the fifth guy on a terrific team that had scoring and rebounding and passing up plenty. Um, so you really didn't even need Jackie Manuel to be a scorer. Same thing goes for kind of a Marcus Ginyard type that you've seen, you know, play that position. Um, so we've seen these things work before. Now, I think what's, what's really going to be important is do we get the scoring from the low post that we need? Um, are the guards able to perform uh, the way that, um, they need to to facilitate to each other and to the to the big guys. Um, it, you don't want to rely on a bunch of scoring from from Leaky Black. Although I do think 
by the time he gets done with this year and certainly into next year. I think he's a much different player than we've seen over the last couple of years. I think he has a projection similar to Theo Pinson. Um, I don't know that he becomes the player that Theo Pinson has become, where he's actually got a, you know, a roster spot with a with a professional team, um, and you know, and scoring in the twenty fives and thirties when he's playing in the G League. Uh, but I do think he becomes a very good player and a very reliable player, and and one that people will look back and appreciate once his time at North Carolina is done. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that you said I agree with, but really it comes down to that he's just too versatile to not put in there and, and hopefully everything takes a step up like you're saying shooting and scoring wise but um and and it goes back to what I was just saying with the point guard is is my worries with these freshmen not getting the preseason stuff that we're used to I mean Curran Walton Puff Johnson you know again it's it, it maybe it's a bad way to say it but you kind of said the same thing is who else are you going to put there right now um you know if, if he struggles and you said give him this year but even if we give him this non-conference season and he's kind of the same player, but yet one of those other guys is, is shooting lights out. It's not like Roy can't make a change. Um, but again, it, it, to me, it comes down to the stability that he would add and also just the versatility, um, whether that's being that second ball handler on the floor to give uh, Love a little bit of, uh, you know, stability to or, or the rebounding that, you know, hopefully we don't need, but if, if the big guys need, there's, again, there's just so many different aspects of the game that he can add to. And as right. long as he is, you know, working on his jump shot and, and improving, uh, it, it, it's one, I mean, it's a player that anybody would want on their team, something like that. All right. So that, that leads us down to one spot here. And this is kind of the, the only spot where I've seen uh, a lot of people kind of debate, uh, and again, I told you, I didn't read your article about this, but if, if people haven't already, they should go to keepingahill.com. You got your, your article up there about the starting five and, and you haven't mentioned before we went live, it, there may be some tweaks here with uh, some news here about uh, how Harris, Anthony Harris's rehab is going and that he looks healthy and he looks kind of ready to go. Um, so who are you going with here in the two spot? Uh, well, so I, you know, I'm not necessarily changing my initial response my, that was my response to you know what's the starting line was going to be was was sort of the status quo which was that in my mind i think the minds of a lot of people that anthony harris wasn't going to be ready for the season um certainly not 100 percent, but as reports suggest and as his uh uh rehab suggests that he will actually be ready for the season and if he is ready for the season i think there's a good chance that he starts in that in that two guard spot um, initially, I had said R.J. Davis, and I think R.J. Davis is capable of playing that that two spot and, and starting there. Um, I think, however, that Roy Williams would be more inclined to put Harris in that spot. Um, granted, he didn't get a ton of experience last year, but he does know the system. He is a, a good player. He's a good defender. Um, we're talking about a guy that's a, a former four-star player, just like R.J. Davis. Um, you know, and it would also give you a very, very capable scorer off the bench. So you talk about having guys that can come in sort of in a second unit um, or in a sort of a, you know, give this guy a breather and put somebody else in. You're not just putting in some defensive specialist when you bring in R.J. Davis. You're bringing in a guy that can shoot lights out, and he can shoot from all over the court. So there would be a benefit to having him come off the bench, at least to start the season. And, and, and I will say with the caveat that I think R.J. Davis could play himself into a starting position. But undoubtedly. Um, I don't think that Anthony Harris will be unsuccessful if, if he starts, but I do think that RJ Davis is going to be a better scorer. Um, so I, I think it really depends on what are you able to get out of Anthony Harris offensively? Is he able to play defense at the level that you expect that he will? Um, you know, how is the scoring between Harris and black? You know, if you have a, just a, a black hole of no scoring between your two and your three, that may force, Roy's hand. He may have to put another scorer in there. You don't want to rely on just Caleb Love, who you should have facilitating the ball, to, you know, to also be scoring, and then just Brooks and Baycott scoring. You want to have scoring from from your wing. Um, so I think a lot of it will depend on, you know, if, if Harris is healthy, I think he may very well start. Um, if he's not, I would have R.J. Davis there. Um, if, if Davis is, you know, coming in and he's shooting 45% from three-point range and he's, you know, you know, passing the ball extremely well and setting up teammates well, I think he could play himself into that starting role. Yeah, and again, it, it, maybe it's a cop-out. People, you know, this is kind of a, a clickbait. Everybody likes to talk about the starting lineup and, and, and you know, go back and forth. And 
but really, I mean, it doesn't come up to us and, and we don't have any idea until we see these guys. And, and obviously Roy sees them every day in practice. Uh, hopefully again, uh, they get that preseason stuff uh, that Roy needs to get them in shape and also to see these guys. Um, but this to me, where it comes down to, it doesn't even matter who starts, you know, the first game or the first, you know, part of the season, the non-conference it's, can we figure out that starter? And I think that's kind of what you're getting at is, do we know who that starter is by January, February, March? Uh, is there a guy that has stepped up and, and earned that spot? Um, and, and like you said, knocks down shots because, yeah, we have the big guys inside that can score. Hope, you know, Caleb Love, we've kind of seen, and we hope that that's what he does at the college level. But if we have, you know, Leaky Black, and we talked about his struggles just a second ago, and then a two guard that's not scoring, that's going to take away production from the big guys because we don't have to guard those guys. And it's, they're going to collapse on Caleb Love. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's more about, and again, maybe this is a cap out because we're not, we're not answering the question or something, but um, you know, who's going to start come February and March. Uh, but like you said, to, it really doesn't matter. Hopefully it doesn't matter because both of them are productive and we have a solidified starter and we have scoring coming off the bench in RJ Davis or, Anthony Harris, whoever it isn't. Now, to follow all that up with, is there anybody else we need to consider? I mean, we got, um, we still got some guys we haven't talked about on the roster. Sure. So actually, I like one of the comments from from Kutek Kirby there. You know, do we have too many big men? And I would say, look at years, look at years past. Um, we've had a shortage of big men, so I, I don't think you can have too many bigs. Um, and and the other thing is that so Brooks has one final year of eligibility. Uh, you know, Baycott next year will be a junior and you have no idea how well he progresses. Does he end up making the jump to the NBA after a really good sophomore season? Does he lead after his junior season? We don't know. So to have a couple of five-star players coming in like Walker Kessler and, and Dayron Sharp, um, who I think uh, will obviously be a starting tandem at some point, uh, I think is very, very valuable. Now, I think Kessler's a little more raw than people may anticipate him being. I, I think he is a good shooter. I think he does stretch the floor. I think he is your sort of new age stretch five kind of a guy. Um, but he is not the polished uh, big man that is ready to come in there and, and take starting minutes right now. Now I do think he will progress a lot over the next year or two. And I think he'll be a very good college player. I think overall though, Sharp is the guy that will be the better of the two college players. I think he's a terrific rebounder right now. He's, I think a more solid overall offensive option is at least if we're talking about traditional post players, um, certainly Kessler's a better shooter. Uh, you know, he's going to have that long range shot over sharp probably forever. Um, but to, to have too many, I, I don't think you can, I think, especially in a Roy Williams system, uh, he loves to run two big guys and his most successful teams have always had, uh, two big guys. You saw the struggles that we had in recent seasons when your big guys, your quote, big guys were Luke may. And, you know, Cameron Johnson was basically a de facto big guy because at six foot seven, he was one of the biggest guys on your team, but Luke May was like your your big guy that you're trotting out there at six foot eight. Like you don't want that, you know. Look back to Sean May and Jawad Williams. You know, you run a four and a five that just had great size and both had good scoring ability. You look at Tyler Hansbro and and Dion Thompson. Uh, look at Tyler Zeller and John Henson um, in 2012. One of my favorite North Carolina teams and a team that should have probably won a title or at least you know played Kentucky for it. Um, you know, these teams had two big men. Um, you know, usually a, a slightly different players, you know, where Jawad Williams could shoot a little bit, you know, you pretty much just found Sean May down low. Um, you know, same thing later on with Hansbro. Hansbro, every once in a while would step out, you know, haha, funny, funny, but he was really, you know, down low, whereas Deion Thompson could kind of shoot the ball a little bit. Um, same thing with Zeller and Henson. Zeller could stretch the floor a little bit. Henson was going to get you a bunch of dunks. Uh, the more of these guys that we can have on the roster, the better, because you never know when somebody's going to leave. And the same thing goes with guards too, which is why, you know, I, I think you, you see him continue to bring in these five-star guards every single year because you just never know how good they're going to be a la Kobe White. Nobody thought Kobe White was only going to be, a, you know, at Chapel Hill for one season, and he was because he was, you know, so good. And there was no reason. And you saw, you know, his rookie season. Yeah, he had some ups and downs, but clearly a guy that doesn't need college ball at this point. Um, his best practice to continue to get better is in the NBA. And that could very well happen with Caleb Love. It could happen with Baycott this year. You know, we just don't know. So um, having too many guys at any position, no, I don't, I don't think so. I would like to see a couple more wings. I'd like to see a couple more elite wings come through North Carolina. Uh, but other than that, I like the roster. 
Yeah, I think in especially like you're uh, you're saying in Roy Williams' system, I don't think you can have too many big guys because he only sees them like point guards. You know that season where Kendall Marshall got hurt, and he kind of said afterwards, "I'm never going to have a shortage of point guards or somebody that can handle the ball." Uh, I think after these last few seasons, again as you mentioned, Roy Williams kind of sees it as I'm not going to be without a couple of big guys that I can put down in there and and you know rule the rebounding uh, stat there and you know, have a backup for when somebody gets hurt or, you know, whatever. To play devil's advocate to that, uh, still with this question up, do we have too many big guys? The only person you didn't, I don't think, I, unless I missed it, uh, you didn't mention was Sterling Manley. And it is, it's, you know, a crab shoot there because of the injuries he's had. But if he's healthy, do we have too many big guys? Uh, I think the first part of that sentence is, is the real key. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to see him healthy. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, we, we basically haven't seen him play for two years. Uh, you know, when he's, when he's in there, he's very effective. I think he's a guy that at one point had a chance to be a starter in North, uh, you know, North Carolina. I, I don't see that being the case now. Um, there's too many talented guys in there. There's too many guys with good size. Um, I, I just, you know, I would love to see him healthy because I think he's a talented player. And, um, even even with him in, in 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 the conversation, I still don't worry about you know too many big guys because the guys that are there right now um, can play two at a time. So you've got Brooks and Baycott in there. Give them a breather. Put in Sharp and Kessler, or um, you know play a big lineup. And you know if you want to play you know Kessler at the three because he can shoot. He gives you great size. Put Sharp and Sterling Manley down low if you've got a huge team. I mean, think about the reason why North Carolina lost to Texas A&M a couple of years ago in the tournament when they got rolled by twenty plus points was because they had no size. They had no size, and Texas A&M, who really wasn't that good, but had a lot of good size, had a lot of guys like, you know, three guys over 6'9". You know, North Carolina couldn't compete with that size. With a roster like this, in terms of size, there's nobody that can compete with them. Um, and there's certainly no reason that they would ever get outmatched, you know, in terms of, of size, because they've got a, just a massive amount of guys that are, you know, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, and over. So I, I love the size. I would love for Manley to be healthy. The only thing that I could see maybe if we're talking about, quote, too many big guys is the concern that you could see a guy transfer out, maybe look for a better situation. You know, maybe Manley gets healthy and he's healthy all season and he doesn't have a lot of opportunity to play because the, the roster's loaded. So he transfers out like, you know, Brandon Huffman did. I don't know, but I, I'm certainly not worried about too much size in the low post. I would much rather see too much than not enough. Right. Yeah, and Roy actually mentioned playing Garrison Brooks at the three, uh, which I think over Kessler is just the defensive. You know, he feels he can move his feet a little bit better than, than Kessler could guarding those guys. But uh, all right, so a couple other guys just to kind of get them into the conversation. Uh, we talked a little bit about Puff Johnson, Kerwin Walton starting over Leaky Black at the three. What would it, what would it take uh, for them to kind of take that starting spot away from Leaky Black, even if it's not, you know, day one, game one? Again, we're talking about ACC or you know March Madness time. I think it's bad if you see that happen because I I, you, I think you really want to see the progression of Leaky Black. I think you want to see him be the best player that he can be. I think ultimately between the three of them, uh, whether people like it or not, the optimal um, situation for this particular North Carolina team right now um, being between a junior Leaky Black and a couple of freshmen that have never played the college game and they're going to get a short off season um, is for Leaky Black to be the best that he can be. And then let the other two guys come in to sort of, you know, if you will, no pressure situations where they're able to sort of shoot the ball with no expectations. And hopefully they can come in and have an impact and, and get comfortable on the perimeter. Um, and then eventually, you know, sort of driving, shooting mid-range shots. But, um, you know, if, if Puff Johnson or Kerwin Walton come in and start at some point, I think it means that, you know, Leaky Black has not been very good, um, which I would prefer to not see that happen. However, um, obviously the progression of the two freshmen um, and seeing their comfort level increase and, and seeing them be, you know, hopefully lights out shooters at some point, it, you know, is a welcome sight because, you know, you know, no, no offense or, or, or no, you know, ill will toward, toward a guy like Andrew Playtech, but we've seen over the, the past few years that he just hasn't been the shooter at the college level that he was recruited to be, or even the player that Roy Williams says he is in practice. I'm um, supposedly this guy hits every shot in practice. He can't hit, the broad side of a barn in a game, you know, he's, he's shot 20%, you know, uh, as a, as a collegiate player from three point range, and that's just not going to cut it. So you want to see a uh, better shooting than that from, from Walton and from Puff Johnson. And I think you will, I think Johnson's going to be a very, very, very good college player. 
So you kind of went already where I was going to go. And I don't know if you, if we we can really talk about it starting, but maybe more as playing time. And, and some people will be really mad about us even talking about it. But like you said, senior, uh, possibly captain. I don't know how Roy picks his captain, but uh, Andrew Playtech. You know, what, I mean, we've seen his playing time kind of go up and down. And like you said, he's had struggles shooting, uh, which has definitely hurt his playing time because he, he hustles and, and not to take anything away from him. You know, he's playing D1 ball at North Carolina and uh, is, is it doing better than a lot of us ever did and never will. Uh, but, you know, how does he kind of, or again, is it a bad thing if he's earning consistent, uh, meaningful playing time over, you know, Harris and RJ Davis and, you know, even taking out those guys that we said at the three and playing a little bit of a smaller lineup, you know, what is, what does it mean or what does it take uh, for play tech to kind of get into the mix? I, I think it would take an incredible change in his ability to shoot the ball. Uh, you know, I know that, that Roy Williams likes seniors. He likes guys with experience. Um, you know, honestly though, you know, if RJ Davis or, or any of those freshmen play any considerable amount of minutes over the first three months of the season, they've basically got the same experience as Playtech because Playtech's barely played over the last few years. And it's because of his inability to shoot the ball. Um, you know, he doesn't have great size. Um, he's not somebody that's going to shut down uh, the, the other team's best or even second best score. He's not some lockdown defender. Um, there haven't been a lot of redeeming qualities to his game. Um, he was recruited as a shooter, kind of a, a Wes Miller uh, type of a type of a role, um, and he simply hasn't been able to to fill that that, that role. Um, so I don't think, with with any level of, of favoritism or preference to seniors that that Roy Williams possesses, um, I don't think there's any possible way that he could ever consider starting play tech or or give him any sizable amount of minutes that keeps more talented guys, be it younger guys. Um, off the court any longer than they than they should be. Um, I think it helps with depth. I think he is a good um, team guy. I, I think he's a guy that that while his shooting may not be working, um, he does know the offense. He does know the role that he's playing, and and can be effective in that um, to an extent. Uh, but I don't see him stealing a bunch of minutes from someone else. Yeah. I, I, again, we want to say we're not we're not trying to dig on on play tech or any, take anything away from him, but uh, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, so we did get a, a comment here, and you've kind of given your thoughts about it already, kind of answered this already. But uh, Charles uh, Diggs here says Sharp is going to start. Uh, he's a monster. You don't sit a guy with a motor, get a rebound and and stuff. He started from day one. Baycott coming off the bench. Uh, he he just not better than Sharp. So. Uh, I don't know if you have anything that you want to kind of respond back to that. Again, like I said, you've, you've given most of your thoughts on, on what it would take away from, from Baycott's uh, game if he didn't start, but I'll, I'll kind of give you the floor if you do want to respond there. Yeah, no, I like Charles spirit. Um, and I, and I agree with him. Sharp is, is going to be a great player. I think he's a great rebounder. He may end up being a better player uh, than Baycott. Um, I, I disagree though, that, that he starts. I, I do think that Baycott will be the one that starts uh, for a number of reasons, but like I said, mainly, the progression of Bicot's game and his importance to the team, um, I think is going to be, I don't think even if, if, even if Sharp came out and was very, very good this year, I don't think that he overshadows Bicot. I don't think that he can create so much distance that it's just like this obvious, like, Oh, wow, we got to start. We got to start Sharp over Bicot. Now, if, if he was coming in and scoring 20 points off the bench and Bicot was just turning the ball over time after time on the blocks. Okay, fine. I, I don't think it's going to be like that. Um, and I think it will honestly help Sharp just as much to come in in that role as it'll help Baycott to be in that role. And I think it'll help the team overall because the next year you could be seeing a situation where it's Sharp starting alongside a junior Baycott. Um, so I, I honestly think that Sharp's only one season away from starting. And I think that will be next year. Um, I just don't see it this year, but I think he'll be very good off the bench. I think he's going to be a terrific rebounder. I think once he's able to get 25, 30 minutes a game. I think he's another guy that's a double, double threat. And I think that as he continues to improve his offensive game, he's going to be a very, very uh, formidable player in the ACC. Yeah. And, and I'll play a devil's advocate a little bit is if, you know, if he, and you kind of alluded to it too, but if he's playing so well and then Baycott is, is, is turning the ball over, or just making mistakes, kind of like you were saying before, again, if, if this happens, it's bad, maybe even not for our team, but it's really bad for Baycott because he's going to lose that confidence. He's going to lose, you know, kind of everything he's been working for. Uh, you know, he came in as a five-star guy and was was going to be this big guy that we have. So 
Um, we'll probably be okay as a team if Baycott is, is still not producing how we want him to, but uh, if Sharp does come in and start, it's probably a bad thing for, for Baycott as far as his um, confidence goes. Uh, I think we also need to remember that Marvin Williams never started a game at North Carolina. He came off the bench and won a national championship, was number two pick in the NBA draft. And not that Sharp's going to do that, but if Marvin Williams can do that, you know, Sharp can can probably do this, you know, not do the same, but be okay coming off the bench knowing, like you said, he's got that next year um, to come in and be the starter and to be the guy or, you know, whatever it is and probably have a lot, a lot, uh, a lot of people looking at him, if, if he can put up numbers coming off the bench, he's going to get some preseason accolades, you know, coming into that starting lineup. Um, well, Ed, Ed Davis, if you'll remember, Ed Davis freshman season did the same thing. Um, Roy brought him off the bench. He was very effective. He was very good. He was, he was very good moving forward after that. It, you know, it certainly isn't going to stunt his growth. When you go to a school like North Carolina, um, at least with recruiting back to the level that it is, uh, maybe not over the last few years, but you know that there's a possibility that you could be a five-star player and, and not start. Um, same thing goes for Duke, Kentucky, all these these schools like this. Um, so when, you know, Dayron Sharp signs on to play at North Carolina, he knows like, look, I've got a couple of guys ahead of me that are, you know, one of them may be player of the year in the in the conference. The other one could be an all-ACC caliber guy. I mean, you know, we're right. talking about Maycott like he had this unsuccessful freshman season. I mean, the guy averaged 9.6 points and 8.3 rebounds. He was a team's right. second leading rebounder. Um, just barely, I, I think he had eight less rebounds than Garrison Brooks total. Um, now, I think the I, difference, I think the difference this year is though, because of last year, the season we had, I think Roy is kind of all bets off the table. Like, like I said, besides Garrison Brooks, I don't think there's any way he could lose his starting position, but if somebody outplays Caleb Love or whatever, I, I think Roy is kind of at a point and he's, you know, you kind of hear it in his voice when he does interviews right now, like how much last year bugged him and like he will do whatever he needs to do to make sure he gets somebody on the court. That's going to make sure that we don't go whatever it was 14 to 19 or whatever is, is last year. So if, if big cat's not producing and, and sharp is looking outstanding, I mean, I, I don't put it past Roy to, to start him uh, and try to, you know, kind of dig into Baycott, kind of like he had to do with Bryce Johnson for three seasons before we got that senior season where he was just outstanding. Uh, you know, I think that's kind of the difference this year as opposed to those others is I don't think any, there's anything hardly that Roy wouldn't do to make sure we're successful this year. Yeah, and, and I don't I don't disagree. I think there's obviously going to be a competition for any position. Um, I think he's going to put the best guy on the court. I think he's also going to put the guy that he trusts the most on the court. Um, like I said, I just don't see Sharp or anyone creating this big of a gap that's going to be so convincing and, and, and all pervasive and, and predicting – you know, success on the court between him and Baycott that's that's going to lead Roy to be like, well, you know, I'm going to put this this freshman out here, you know, as opposed to a guy that started 30 games for me last year. I think Baycott will be better than what people are thinking. I, if he can get stronger in the post, it changes everything. Right. Because the amount of times that he turned the ball over three feet from the goal, if he turns those into either layups, dunks, or made free throws, which all were a little bit problematic for him last year, um, but with extra strength and with with just some practice on, like I said earlier, keeping the ball at least above his waist, but preferably, you know, if you get a board, put it right back up. Don't go down with it. You're a, you, you know you're a you're a six foot ten guy that's bigger than pretty much everybody out there. Use that to your advantage. Um, and I think he will this year. I think he'll be very good. But you know, if Sharp is so good that it's undeniably stupid to do anything other than start him, then start him. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And I again uh, maybe because we haven't had sports and we haven't. I, mean, I haven't podcasted for a couple months here, but I had to, I had to kind of just go everywhere I could with this one. But I think we've ran the gamut here. Uh, unless, Blake, you got something that I've missed, uh, somebody we haven't talked about that we need to, uh, some kind of, something up your sleeve that we need to mention. I mean, you know, we, we, you, you got to hope that there's no injury to the, to the guard position because now you have, you have lost um, Jeremiah Francis, who, um, I, who I don't blame for leaving. You, you know, again, when you, when you talk about a school like, North Carolina, there's a chance that you get a bunch of good guys in there, and then guys are kind of left out in the cold. And Francis felt like you know he's not going to get the minutes that he wants to play, so he he left. Um, but certainly now, even though there are guys that can play the point, um, you don't have a ton of true point guards on the roster. So you've got to hope that Love stays healthy, um, that R.J. Davis is able to be all of that sort of combo guard that he was in high school, and and the injury bug just stays away this year because last year was unbelievable. 
Um, everything that could go wrong last year went wrong for the Tar Heels. Um, they weren't a very good team anyway, but certainly the injuries and all of the things that happened, um, you know, b- between Harris ACL injury, between, you know, Cole Anthony getting hurt and being out a number of games, um, they caught playing hurt for half the season. Uh, you know, Sterling Manley, again, like we mentioned, being out all year, uh, just the, the amount of injuries was unbelievable. Um, you know, the only guy that really wasn't affected by injury was Garrison Brooks, which thankfully well, I mean, he had a great that's season. That's not true either, though, because he had, I mean, got poked in the eye how many times. Well, he just kind of so, played through it. Which he turned it into a fashion statement. He looked he looked great <laughs> doing it. But, uh, it, you know, at least he avoided sort of the major injury surgery thing. Uh, I'll tell you what, if, if something were to happen to him, this, this team's in trouble. I don't care what big guys we have coming off the bench. Like, that guy is a guy that we need. Caleb Love and Garrison Brooks have to stay healthy this year, period. Yeah. All right. So again, I think, I think we've got it all. If there's other stuff that you guys think we missed, uh, hit us up on Twitter, uh, hit us uh, in the comments here on YouTube, uh, kind of wherever you're listening, I'll, I'll get what the comments are. Follow Blake, uh, keeping it everything that he's writing and putting up there as well on Twitter, Blake KCMO. Um, but uh, we're starting to hopefully get back into where we can have stuff to talk about get people back on campus, uh, start looking at player predictions, predictions for the season, uh, all that. But it, it, it may be a little bit different this year. It'll be, it'll be something to kind of keep an eye on. Eye on. Uh, Blake, it was a pleasure to have you back on the podcast. Um, until next time, though, go Heels. Go Heels. Thanks, Dan.